The foul Bentley was protected by a fingerprint scanner and a keypad that required an 8-digit code. The code was changed every month, and so it took Artemis a few seconds to mentally rewind almost 8 years and remember the right set of numbers. He slid across the front seat's tan leather upholstery and pressed his thumb to a second scanner tucked behind the steering wheel. A spring-loaded compartment slid smoothly from the dash. It was not a large compartment, but big enough to hold a clip of cash, platinum credit cards, and a spare cell phone in its cradle. No gun, said Holly, when Artemis emerged from the car, though one of Butler's guns would be clunky in her fingers. No gun, confirmed Artemis. I wouldn't be able to hit an elephant with one of Butler's pistols even if I had one. Elephants are not the quarry this evening, said Artemis, speaking in English now that they were out of the trunk. Lemurs are, and at any rate, as we could hardly shoot at our opponent on this particular adventure, perhaps it's better that we are not armed. Not really, said Holly. I may not be able to shoot you or the lemur, but I bet that more opponents will turn up. You have a knack for making enemies. Artemis shrugged. Genius inspires resentment, a sad fact of life. Genius and robbing stuff. Mulch chimed in from his perch on the lip of the cr car trunk. Take it from one who knows. Nobody likes a smart thief. Artemis drummed his fingers on the fender. We have certain advantages. Elfin magic, digging talents. I have almost eight more years of experience in the art of mischief making than the Artem Artemis does not have. <laughs> mischief making? Holly scoffed. I think you're being a little gentle on yourself. Grand larceny is closer to the mark. Artemis stopped drumming. One of your favorite powers is speaking in tongues, correct? I'm talking to you, aren't I? Responded Holly. Just how many tongues can you speak in? Holly smiled. She knew Artemis' devious mind well enough to realize exactly where he was going with this. As many as you want. Good. We need to split up. You take the above ground route into Rathdown Park. Mulch and I will travel underground. If we need a distraction, use your gift. It would be a pleasure said Holly, and immediately turned translucent, just as though she were a creature of purest water. The last thing to go was her smile. Just like the Cheshire Cat. Artemis remembered a few lines from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. But I don't want to go among mad people, said Alice. Oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. Artemis glanced at the pungent dwarf, searching his living beard for stored insects. We're all mad here too, he thought. Holly approached the main door of Rathdown Institute with care, even though she was shielded. The people had thought themselves invisible to Butler once before and had paid with trauma and bruises. She would not underestimate the bodyguard, and the fact that he was once again her enemy set her stomach churning with nervous acid. The human clothes jumped and scratched along her frame. They were not built for shielding, and in a matter of minutes they would shake to pieces. I miss my neutrino, she thought, looking at the reinforced steel door with the dark unknown beyond it. And I miss Foley and his satellite uplinks. But at heart, Holly was an adventurer, and so the idea of quitting never even occurred to her. It was difficult to operate mechanisms while shielded, so Holly powered down for the few seconds necessary to jimmy the door with her Omni tool. It was an old model, but Holly's mother had paid an extra few ingots for upgrades. The standard Omnitool would open any door operating on a simple mechanical lock and key system. This one could short electronic locks too, and even deactivate simple alarms. But that shouldn't be necessary, she thought. As far as Artemis remembers, he turned off all the alarms. The thought didn't give much comfort. Artemis had been wrong about this trip already. In less than five seconds, the Omnitool did its job and vibrated gently, like a cat purring in its own cleverness. The heavy door swung open silently under the lightest touch, and Holly buzzed up her shield. Stepping into the Rathdown Institute, Holly felt more mission anxiety than she had in years. I'm a rookie again, some kid straight out of the academy, she realized. My mind is experienced, but my body is overruling it. And then, I better get this monkey quick before adolescence kicks in. Young Artemis had turned off the security on his way into the Institute. It had been an easy thing to bypass all the alarms with the director's pass card. Earlier in the day, when he had been given the guided tour, he had posed several complicated questions on the validity of the theory of evolution. The director, a committed evolutionist, had allowed Artemis' arguments to distract him long enough to have his pocket picked by Butler. Once the pass card was in the bodyguard's possession, he simply slotted it into a battery-powered card cloner in his breast pocket and whistled a few bars of Mozart to cover the whir of the machine. 
Two minutes later, all the information they needed was stored in the cloner's memory. The director's card was back in the man's pocket, and Artemis suddenly decided that maybe evolution wasn't a bad theory after all. Though there are more holes in it than a Dutch dam made of Swiss cheese, he had confided to Butler on the way home from Rathdow Park. Butler had been encouraged by this statement. It was almost a straightforward joke. Later that evening, young Artemis had popped a button camera into the air conditioning duct at the rear of the Bentley. All the better to keep an eye on our guests. The female was interesting. Fascinating, in fact. The darts would wear off soon, and it would be intriguing to watch her reaction. Much more so than that of the higher suit teenager, even though his broad forehead suggested intelligence, and his general features had a lot in common with the Fowl family's own. In fact, he reminded Artemis of an old photo he had once seen of his father as a boy, working on an archaeological dig in South America. Perhaps the male captive was a distant cousin, hoping to claim some kind of birthright now that father was missing. There was much to be investigated here. The button camera was broadcasting to his cell phone, and 10-year-old Artemis checked the screen occasionally as Butler guided him through Rathdown Park toward the lemur's cage. Focus, Artemis, the bodyguard chided. One dastardly crime at a time. Artemis glanced up from his phone. Dastardly, Butler. Dastardly. Honest, we are not cartoon characters. I do not have a villainous laugh or an eye patch. Not yet. Though you'll have an eye patch soon enough if you don't concentrate on the job at hand. They were passing underneath Rathdown Park's aquarium through a plexiglass tunnel that allowed scientists and the occasional visitor to observe the species housed in the million gallon tank. The tank mimicked as far as possible the inhabitants' natural environment. Different compartments had different temperatures and different vegetation. Some were salt water, others were fresh, but all housed endangered or rare creatures. Tiny bulbs dotted the ceiling above, simulating stars, and the only other light coming from the bioluminescence of an albino lantern shark, which shadowed Artemis and Butler along the tunnel until its snout bumped plexiglass. Artemis was more interested in his cell phone than the shark's eerily glowing photophores. Events were unfolding on his screen that were close to incredible. Artemis stopped in his tracks to fully absorb what he was seeing. The foul manor intruders had escaped the Bentley trunk with the help of an accomplice, another non-human. I am imprinted in a new world here. These creatures are potentially more lucrative than a lemur. Should I abandon this venture and concentrate on the non-humans? Artemis maximized the volume on his handset, but the tiny microphone attached to the button camera could only pick up snatches of the conversation. It was mostly in some alien tongue, but some of the talk was in English, and he heard the word lemur more than once. Perhaps this lemur is more valuable than I realized. The animal is the bait that lures these creatures in. A minute passed with only the small revol revolting dwarf-like thing in the screen, perching its disproportionately large backside on the rim of the trunk. Then the female appeared, only to promptly disappear, Rathdown Park's famous pylons filling the screen where she had been. Artemis tightened his grip on the phone. Invisibility? The energy involved in creating a reflective field or needed to generate high-speed red vibration must be incredible. He quickly navigated the phone's menu and activated the digital thermal imager, a decidedly non-standard option, and was relieved to see the female's creature's form blossom on screen in warm tones. Good. Not gone, just hard to see. Keeping one eye on the phone, Artemis called to his bodyguard. Butler, old friend. Slight change of plans. The bodyguard knew better than to hope the lemur hunt was off. We're still on the trail of a little creature, though, I bet. Creatures, said ten-year-old Artemis. Plural. Fourteen-year-old Artemis was not enjoying the view. To distract himself, he composed a haiku describing the sight before him. Pale, shuddering globes churn their poisonous cargo. Bald heads in a bag. Mulchtigums was not feeling quite so poetic. He stopped digging and rehinged his jaw. Could you please stop shining that flashlight on my backside? I blister easily. We dwarves are extremely photosensitive, even in artificial light. Artemis had taken the flashlight from the Bentley's breakdown kit and was following Mulch through a fresh tunnel to the lemur's cage. The dwarf had assured him that the tunnel was sufficiently short for him to hold in the dirt and air until they reached the other end, making it safe for Artemis to be directly behind him. Artemis averted the light for a few seconds, thinking that a bum blister was the last thing he wanted to see. But after a while, the beam strayed back onto the pale, wobbling flesh once more. Just a quick question. 
If you can hold in all of the diggings, then why does your bum flap need to be open? Mulch was spitting large wads of dwarf phlegm onto the wall to shore up the tunnel. In case of an emergency, I could swallow a buried lug of metal or a strip of an old tire. Now those I would have to evacuate on the spot, annoying mud boy to the rear or not. No sense in ruining my trousers too, is there dopey? I suppose not, said Artemis, thinking that with such a wide board loaded weapon pointed at him, he could bear being called dopey. Anyway, continued the dwarf, hawking another wad onto the wall. You should consider yourself privileged. Not many humans have seen a dwarf working with spit. This is what you might call an ancient art. First, you... I know, I know, interrupted Artemis impatiently. First you excavate, then you strengthen the walls with your spittle, which harden on contact with the air, providing it's out of your mouth, obviously. And it's luminous too, amazing material. Mulch's behind wobbled in surprise. How do you know these secrets? You told me, or rather, you will tell me. Time travel, remember? The dwarf peered over his shoulders, eyes red in the glow of the spittle. Just how close do we become? Very close. We get an apartment together, and after a whirlwind courtship, you marry my sister and honeymoon in Vegas. I love Vegas, said Mulch wistfully. Such snide wit. I can see how we might be friends. All the same, keep your comments to yourself, or we might have to see how funny you are covered in tunnel waste. Artemis swallowed hard, then moved the flashlight away from Mulch's behind. The plan was a simple one. They would tunnel underneath the compound and wait below the lemur's cage for Holly to contact them on the short-range LEP adhesive communicator stuck to Artemis' cheek, part of Mulch's stash. From that point forward, the plan became fluid. Either they would pop up and grab the lemur while Holly caused a consternation among the animals, or if young Armes had already secured the lemur, Mulch would dig a hole under Butler and make it easier for Holly to relieve the boy of his prize. All very straightforward, thought Artemis, which is unusual for me. Okay, mud boy, said Mulch, scooping a bulb-shaped hollow with his flat fingers. We're here. X marks the monkey. Lemur, corrected Artemis automatically. Are you certain you can distinguish this particular animal scent from all the others? Mulch held a hand to his heart in mock affront. I certain? I am a dwarf human. A dwarf nose can tell the difference between grass and clover, between black pear and brown, between dog poo and wolf poo. Artemis groaned. I shall take that as a yes. And so you should. Keep this up and I may choose not to marry your sister. If I had a sister, I'm sure she would be inconsolable. They crouched on the hollow for several minutes, the park's nighttime growls and snores drifting down through the, through the clay. By some curious anomaly, once the sounds penetrated the tunnel's coating of dwarf spittle, they were trapped inside and bounced off the walls in conflicting waves. Artemis felt as though he were literally in the lion's den. As if this wasn't disturbing enough, he noticed that Mulch's cheeks were glowing bright pink. All of them. Problems? He asked, unable to mask a nervous tremor. I've been holding in this gas for a long time, replied the dwarf through clenched teeth. It's coming out soon. Got any sinus problems? Artemis shook his head. Pity. This would have cleared them right up. If it hadn't been for Artemis' determination to save his mother, he would have bolted right there. Luckily for Artemis' nasal passages, Holly beeped him on the adcom. The communicator was a basic vibration model that sent signals directly to Artemis' ear without any external noise. Artemis heard Holly's words, but not her voice. The adcom was only sophisticated enough to produce robotic tones. In position. Over. Artemis placed a finger on the communicator, completing the circuit that allowed him to speak. Received. We are directly below the target's cage. Can you see the opposition? Negative. No visual. But I do see the lemur. He seems to be asleep on a low branch. I can easily reach him. Negative, Holly. Hold your position. We will secure the target. You watch my younger self. Understood. Don't hang around, Artie. Get up, get down, and back to the car. Artie? Artemis was surprised that Holly would call him that. It was his mother's pet name for him. Got it. Up, down, and back. Artie? Mulch tapped him urgently on the shoulder. Whenever you're ready, mud boy. Now would be great. Very well. Proceed. Try to be quiet. Mulch changed position and pointed the crown of his head to the tunnel roof, squatting low on his haunches. Too late for quiet. Pull your jacket over your face. 
Artemis barely had time to do what had been asked. When Mulch released a thundering cylinder of gas and earth, spraying the boy with undigested clods. The shell of dwarf spittle cracked in a thousand places, and Mulch was borne aloft by a churning pillar of force, easily punching through the surface. Once the dust had settled somewhat, Artemis scrambled after him into the cage. Mulch had pinballed off the low cage ceiling and was unconscious, blood matting his already tangled hair, his bum flap fluttering like a wind sock while the remainder of the tunnel waste escaped. Low cage ceiling? The lemur in the next cage seemed highly amused by all the commotion and hopped up and down on a truncated branch wedged between the bars. The next cage, realized Artemis. We're not in the lemur's cage. What cage are we in? Before he had time to investigate, his cheek beeped and an emotionless robotic voice droned into his ear. Get Mulch out of there, Artie. Get back down now. What is it? What's in this cage? wondered Artemis. Then a 400-pound Ugandan mountain gorilla crashed into him, leaving the thought behind like a speech bubble. Young Artemis and Butler were watching all of this through a slot windows of camouflaged hide that sat in front of the cages. The hide had been built inside a rockery and water feature and allowed close study of the various animals without disturbing the natural rhythms of their day. The director had been kind enough to let Artemis sit in the observer's chair earlier that day. Someday, we'll be able to run the Hyde's thermal imaging camera and all this equipment from that chair, he had said. Perhaps sooner than that, Artemis had replied. Oh dear, said Butler, the phrase sounding overly delicate in his gravelly voice. That must have hurt. He reached into his pocket for the dart gun. I'd better lend a hand, or at least a dart. Butler had been busy with his darts. Two night workers lay unconscious on cots at the rear of the hide. Through the slot window, they had a clear view of the male intruder being shaken like a ragdoll by an enormous gorilla. The cage's third occupant had collapsed and appeared to be racked by an energetic bout of flatulence. Incredible, thought Artemis. This day is full of surprises. He tapped a few keys on the key computer keyboard before him, redirecting the compound's thermal imaging camera. I don't think a dart will be necessary he said. Help is already on the way. Sure enough, a red-hearted glow bounced across the cobbled walkway, hovering before the gorilla cage. Now this should be interesting, mused ten-year-old Artemis. Holly was forced into action. She had been discreetly tucked away behind the broad trunk of an important baobab tree, shielded off, conserving magic, keeping an eye out for young Artemis, when Mulch blew a hole in the earth into the wrong cage. He exploded from the ground in a mini cyclone of debris and bounced off a few surfaces like a cartoon pinball before collapsing onto the cage floor. The cage's resident, a black and gray bull gorilla, shot straight up, woken from deep sleep. His eyes were wide but blurred, his teeth yellow and barred. Stay down, Artemis, she thought. Stay in the hole. No such luck. Artemis clambered to the surface, carefully navigating the simple climb. The time stream had not granted him any agility. As Artemis often said, the physical was not his area. Holly thumbed her adcom. Get Mulch out of there, Artie! She shouted. Get back down now! It was too late. The gorilla had decided these newcomers were a threat to be dealt with. It rolled from its nest of leaves and bark, landed on eight knuckles, the impact sending a jarring wave along its arm hair. Holly buzzed up her shield as she ran, silver strands floating behind her as the wig fell apart, marking her trail. The gorilla attacked, grabbing a surprised Artemis fowl by the shoulders, roaring in his face, head back, teeth like a bear trap. Holly was at the gate, powering down, pulling the Omnitool from her pocket, jamming the business end into the lock. She surveyed the scene inside the cage while she waited for the tool to work. Mulch was up on his elbows now, shaking a groggy head. It'd be a minute or two before he was in any shape to help, if he deigned to help a human stranger. Anyway, it was immaterial. A moment or two would be too late for Artemis. The Omnitool beeped and the cage door swung open. A narrow walkway extended from the footpath, crossing a moat and sliding into grooves on the habitat floor. Holly charged across without hesitation, waving her arms, shouting, making herself a target. The gorilla huffed and snorted, gathering Artemis close to its chest, warning Holly to stay back. Artemis' head flopped on his shoulders, and his eyes were half-closed. 
Holly stopped ten feet from the animal and lowered her arms in gaze, a non-threatening stance. The gorilla made a few fake attacks, thundering to within a foot of Holly, then contemptuously turning his back, all the while grunting and barking, pressing Artemis to his chest. Artemis's hair was slicked back with blood, and a crimson trickle leaked from the corner of his left eye. One arm was broken, and blood pouched the sleeve on his tracksuit. Holly was shocked, appalled. She felt like crying and running away. Her friend was injured, possibly dead. Get a grip! She told herself, you are older than you look. One of the fairy magical powers was the gift of tongues, and this encompassed a rudimentary grasp of some of the more sophisticated animal tongues. She would never be discussing global warming with a dolphin, but she knew enough for basic communication. With gorillas, it was as much about body language as it was actually said. Holly squatted low, elbows crooked, knuckles on the earth, spine curved forward, the posture of a friend, Then she funneled her lips and hooted several times. Danger, the hoots said. Danger is near. The gorilla did a comical double take, amazed to hear gorilla speak coming from this creature. It sensed a trick, but was not sure what that trick might be. And when in doubt, beat your chest. The gorilla dropped Artemis, stood two f on tall feet, and thrusting forward chin and pectorals, began beating its chest with open palms. I am king here. Do not trifle with me, was a clear message. A wise sentiment indeed, but Holly had no choice. She darted forward, hooting all the time, throwing in the odd terrified screech, and then, against the advice of every wildlife expert who had ever held a steady cam, she looked directly into the animal's eyes. Leopard! she hooted, layering her voice with the fairy mesmer. Leopard! The gorilla's fury was replaced by dull confusion, which was in turn pushed aside by terror. Leopard! Climb! Holly hooted. Moving with less than its customary grace, the gorilla stumbled toward the rear of the cage, moving as though underwater, senses dulled by the mesmer. Trees and foliage were batted aside, leaving a wake of sap-crowned trunks and flattened grass. In moments, the animal had disappeared deep into the dark recesses of its artificial habitat. Fearful gibberings floated from the upper canopy. Holly would feel bad later about putting the beast under such a spell, but now there was not a heartbeat to waste on guilt. Artemis was grievously injured, perhaps mortally so. The gorilla had dropped Artemis like a carcass that had been picked clean. He lay there, still as the dead. No, don't think that! Holly raced to her friend's side, skidding the final yard to her knees. Too far gone. He's too far gone. Artemis's face was pale as bone. His long black hair was matted with blood, and the whites of his eyes were twin crescents through hooded lids. Mother, he said, the word riding on a breath. Holly reached out her hands, magic already dancing on her fingertips, shooting off an arc like tiny sun flares. She froze before the magic could make the jump to Artemis' body. If I heal Artemis, will I also damn him? Is my magic tainted with spelltropy? Artemis thrashed weakly, and Holly could actually hear bones grating in his sleeve. There was blood on his lips, too. He will die if I don't help. At least if I heal him, there's a chance. Holly's hands were shaking and her eyes were blurred with tears. Pull yourself together. You are a professional. She didn't feel very professional. She felt like a girl out of her depth. Your body's playing tricks on your mind. Ignore it. Holly cupped Artemis' face gently in both hands. Heal, she whispered, almost sobbing. The magical sparks leaped like dogs unleashed, sinking into Artemis's pores, knitting bones, healing skin, staunching internal bleeding. The sudden transition from Death's Door to Hale and Hardy was rough on Artemis. He shuddered and bucked, teeth chattering, hair frizzing in an electro halo. Come on, Artemis, said Holly, bending over him like a mourner. Wake up! There was no reaction for several seconds. Artemis looked like a healthy corpse, but then that was how he usually looked. Then his mismatched eyes opened, lids flickering like hummingbird wings as his system rebooted. He coughed and shuddered, flexing fingers and toes. Holly, he said when his vision had cleared. His smile was sincere and grateful. You saved me again. Holly was laughing and crying at the same time, tears spilling onto Artemis' chest. Of course I saved you, she said. I couldn't do anything without you. 
and because she was happy and flushed with magic, Holly leaned down and kissed Artemis, magic sparking around the contact like tiny fireworks. Ten-year-old Artemis Fowl was keeping one eye on the drama unfolding in the gorilla cage. Drawn the lightest gorilla, he commented to Butler, given the name by Dr. Thomas S. Savage, an American missionary through West Africa, who first scientifically discovered the gorilla in 1847. You don't say, murmured the bodyguard, who was more interested in the brute's bite radius than its proper name. They had used the commotion as cover to slip out from the artificial hide and across the small courtyard to the lemur's cage, which was beside the gorilla's. The strange newcomers were far too busy to notice them swipe the cage's car keyed lock and open the gate door. Look at those two, wasting time. You wouldn't catch me doing that. Butler snorted, as he usually did immediately before delivering a deadpan line. Most people never catch you do anything, Artemis. Artemis allowed himself a chuckle. This was an interesting day, and he was enjoying the challenges that it presented. And here we are said Artemis quietly, the last silky Sifika lemur in the world, the hundred thousand euro primate. The lemur was perched high in a Madagascar palm, clinging to the branches with its long grasping toes and opposable thumb digits. Its coat was snow white with a brown patch on its chest. Artemis pointed at the animal. That coloring results from chest scent marking and the sternal glanier gland. Uh-huh, said Butler who cared slightly less about this than he did about the gorilla's scientific name. Let's just grab the animal and get out of here before our friends next door regroup. I think we have a moment or two, said Artemis. Butler studied the strangers in the adjacent cage. It was surprising that the male was not in pieces by now, but somehow the female had appeared from nowhere and chased the gorilla off. Impressive. That one had a few tricks up her sleeve. There was some serious technology behind her. Perhaps some sort of camouflage software in the clothing, which would explain the sparks. The Americans, he knew, were developing an all-terrain camouflage suit. One of his military contacts had sent him a link to a leaked video on the internet. There was another creature in the cage, the hairy individual who would release the first two from the Bentley, picking what was supposed to be an unpickable lock in the process. The creature was neither man nor beast, a rough stumpy creature who had been propelled through the earth by some force and was now suffering from a debilitating attack of gas. Somehow, this thing had managed to dig a 30-yard tunnel in a matter of minutes. If it had been for the fact that the cages were modular with overlapping walls, then the creature would have been in the same cage as the lemur. As it was, while it emerged directly below the lemur, it was one cage over. Butler knew that Artemis would be just itching to study these strange creatures, but now was not the time. They were in a position of total ignorance, and people in that position often died without being enlightened. The bodyguard drew his dart pistol, but Artemis recognized the sound of a gun sliding from a holster and waved an index finger. That's our last option. I don't want our little friend breaking his neck on the way down. First, we try gentle persuasion. From his pocket, Artemis tugged a small Ziploc bag containing an amber gel flecked with black and green. My own concoction, he explained. The Sifikas are from the Irijale family of primates, which, as you know, is a strictly vegetarian family. Who wouldn't know that? Wondered Butler, who had not exactly put away his pistol. Artemis unzipped the bag, releasing a sweet, thick aroma that wound its way upward toward the lemur. Sap concentrate with a potpourri of uh, African vegetation. No lemur could resist this. But if this particular primate's brain is stronger than his stomach, fire away. One shot, if you please, and avoid the head. The needle alone would probably be enough to crack that tiny skull. Butler would have snorted, but the lemur was moving. It crawled along the branch, dipping its pointed nose to catch the odor, touching the smell with a darting pink tongue. Hmm, said the bodyguard. That concoction won't work on humans, I suppose. Ask me again in six months, said Artemis. I am doing some pheromone experiments. The lemur scampered forward now, hypnotized by the glorious aroma. When the branch ran out, it dropped to the ground and hopped forward on two legs, fingers outstretched toward the bag. Artemis grinned. This game is over. Maybe not, said Butler. In the cage beside them, the long-haired boy was on his feet, and the female was making a very strange noise. The corona of magic around 14-year-old Artemis and Holly faded, 
and along with it went the dreamlike trance insulating Artemis' mind. He was instantly alert. Holly had kissed him! Artemis backpedaled, jumping to his feet and spreading his arms wide to counteract the sudden dizziness. Uh, uh, thanks, he said awkwardly. That was unexpected. Holly smiled, feeling a little embarrassed. Artemis, you're okay! Any more healings will be nothing but scar tissue held together by magic thread! Artemis thought it would be nice to stay here and talk like this, but one cage over was his future escaping with his past. He understood immediately what had happened. Mulcho's nose had led them to the right place, but the cages were built like interlocking blocks, and so the lemur had been above them, but also in the next cage. He should have remembered that, if he had been here before. But Artemis had no memory of visiting the central compound. As far as he was aware, the park director had brought the lemur into a special viewing room. This was confusing. Very well, I see where we are. He was thinking aloud, steadying his mind, trying to forget the kiss for now. Think about it later. Artemis rubbed the red sparks from his eyes, then turned as quickly as the post-healing vertigo would allow. There he was, his younger self, enticing the silky Sifika lemur with a bag of amber paste. Sap, I bet, perhaps with a few twigs and leaves. Wasn't I a clever boy? An immediate solution was needed. A fluid, quick-fire plan. Artemis rubbed his eye sockets as if that could sharpen his mind. Mulch, can you tunnel? The dwarf opened his mouth to answer, but threw up instead. I don't know, he said finally. My head's a bit flippy-floppy. Stomach, too. That bash really shook me. His belly made a sound like an outboard motor. Excuse me, I think I gotta... He did indeed gotta. Mulch crawled into a fern patch and let fly with the remainder of his stomach contents. Several leaves wilted on the spot. No use, thought Artemis. I need a miracle or that lemur's gone and dead. He grabbed Holly's shoulders. Do you have any magic left? A little, Artemis. A few sparks, maybe. Can you talk to the animals? Holly twisted her chin to the left until her neck bone clicked, shaking the tank. I could do that, anything except trolls. They don't fall for that trick. Artemis nodded, th muttering to himself, thinking. Okay, okay, uh, I want you to scare that lemur away from me, the younger me, and I need confusion. Can you do that? I can try. Holly closed her eyes, breathed deeply through her nose, filling her lungs, then threw her head back and howled. It was a fantastic noise. Lions, apes, wolves, and eagles, they were all in there. The howl was punctuated by the staccato chatter of monkeys and the hiss of a thousand snakes. Artemis the Elder stepped back, instinctively terrified. Some primal part of his brain interpreted this message as fear and pain. His skin crawled and he had to fight his every instinct not to run and hide. Artemis the Younger reached down to the lemur, dangling the Ziploc bag in front of its twitching nose. The lemur laid the pads of its fingers on Artemis' wrist. I have him thought the Irish boy. The money for the expedition is mine. Then a wall of unholy sound blasted him like a force 10 wind. Young Artemis staggered back, dropping the bag of paste, suddenly irrationally terrified. Something wants to kill me. But what? Every animal in the world, it sounds like. The park's residents were thoroughly spoke to. They screeched and chattered, rattling their cages, hurling themselves against the bars. Monkeys tried repeatedly to leap across the moats surrounding their islands. A thousand-pound Sumerian rhino charged the heavy doors of its cage, rattling the hinges with each attack. A red wolf snarled and snapped. An Iberian lynx hissed, slashing the air, and a snow leopard chased its tail, flicking its head and meowing anxiously. Buller could not help but shift his focus. It's the female creature, he stated, making some kind of sound. It's riling these animals up. I'm a bit disturbed myself. Artemis did not take his gaze from the lemur. You know what to do, he said to his bodyguard. Butler knew. If there was an obstacle preventing the completion of a mission, remove the obstacle. He strode quickly to the bars, poked the pistol's muzzle through the mesh, and put a dart into the female's shoulder. She stumbled backward, her fantastic orchestra of animal sounds squawking to a halt. Butler felt a shudder of guilt which almost caused him to misstep on his way to Artemis' side. Twice now he had to trank this girl, or whatever she was, 
without having any idea what the chemicals were doing to her non-human system. His only consolation was that he had loaded small dosage darts as soon as he had secured the night watchman. She shouldn't be out too long, a few minutes tops. The lemur was spooked now, tiny hands tickling the space before him. The sap cocktail was tempting, but there was danger here of the worst kind, and the urge to live was overriding the desire for a tasty treat. No, said Artemis, seeing fear cloud the creature's eyes. It's not real, there's no danger. The little simian was not convinced, as if it could read the boy's intentions and the sharp angles of his face. The silky Sifika squeaked once as though pinpricked, then scampered across Artemis's arms, over his shoulder, and out the cage door. Butler lunged for the tail, but missed by a hair. He closed his fingers into a fist. Perhaps it's time to admit defeat on this one. We are dangerously unprepared, and our adversaries have... abilities we know nothing about. His charger's reply was to hurry after the lemur. Artemis, wait, sighed Butler. If we must proceed, then I will take the lead. They want the lemur, P Artemis panted as he ran, and so it becomes more valuable than it was. When we catch the animal, then we are position of power. Catching the animal was easier said than done. The lemur was incredibly agile and found purchase on the smoothest of surfaces. It darted without a wobble along a metal railing, leaping fully ten feet to the lower branches of a potted palm, and from there jumped to the compound wall. Shoot! hissed Artemis. It occurred to Butler briefly that he did not care for Artemis' expression. Almost cruel, his brow creased where a ten-year-old's brow should not have creases. But he would worry about that later. For now, he had an animal to sedate. Butler was quick, but the Sophie Sifica was quicker. In a flash of fur, it scaled the wall and dropped outside into the night, leaving a blurred white jet stream in its wake. Wow, said Butler, almost in admiration. That was fast. Artemis was not impressed by his bodyguard's choice of words. Wow! I think this merits more than a wow! Our quarry has escaped, and with it, the funds for my Arctic expedition! At this point, Butler was fast losing interest in the lemur. There were other, less ignoble ways to raise funds. He shuddered to think of the ribbing he would have to endure if an account of this night somehow made it to the farmer's bar in L.A., which was owned by one ex-blue diamond bodyguard and frequented by many more. But in spite of his distaste for the mission, Butler's sense of loyalty forced him to share a fact that the park director had mentioned earlier, when Artemis was busy studying the alarm system. There is something that I know which you may not know, he said archly. Artemis was not in the mood for games. Oh, really? And what would that be? Lemurs are tree creatures, replied Butler. That little guy is spooked, and he's going to climb the biggest tree he can find even if it isn't actually a tree, if you see what I mean. Artemis saw immediately, which wasn't difficult, as the huge structures cast a lattice of moon shadows over the entire compound. Of course, old friend, he said, his frown crease disappearing. The pylons! Things were going disastrously wrong for Artemis the Elder. Mulch was injured, Holly was unconscious again, feet sticking out of the dwarf's hole, and he himself was fast running out of ideas. The deafening clamor of a hundred endangered species going berserk was not helping his concentration. The animals are going ape, he thought. Then, what a time to develop a sense of humor. All he could do was prioritize. I need to get Holly out of here, he realized. That is the most important thing. Mulch moaned, rolling onto his back, and Artemis saw that there was a bleeding gash on his forehead. He stumbled to the dwarf's side. I imagine you're in great pain, he said. It's to be expected with such a laceration. Bedside manner was not one of Artemis' strong suits. You have a rather large scar, but then looks aren't really that important to you. Mulch squinted at Artemis through a narrowed eye. Are you trying to be funny? Oh my god, you're not. That was actually the nicest thing you'd think of to say. He dabbed at his bloody forehead with a finger. Oh, that hurts. Of course. I'll have to seal it. You know all about this dwarf talent, I suppose. Naturally, said Artemis, keeping a straight face. I've seen it a dozen times. I doubt it, grunted Mulch, plucking a wiggling beard hair from his chin. But I don't have much of a choice now, do I? 
With the L LEP elf in Dreamland, I won't be getting any magical help from that quarter. Artemis heard a rustling in the undergrowth at the rear of the cage. You better hurry it up. I think the gorilla is overcoming his fear of fairies. Wincing, Mulch introduced the beard hair to his gash. It took off like a tadpole, poking through the skin, stitching the flaps together. Though he groaned and shuddered, Mulch managed to stay conscious. When the hair had finished its work and the wound was tied up tighter than a fly in a ball of spiderweb, Mulch spat on his hand and rubbed the gooey mess onto the wound. All sealed, he proclaimed. Then, upon seeing the glint in Artemis's eye, Don't get any ideas, mud boy. This only works on dwarves. And what's more, my beard hair only works for me. You poke one of my lovelies into your skin and all you get is an infection. The rustling in the undergrowth grew louder, and Artemis Fowl decided to forego further information, which for him was almost unheard of. Time we were off. Can you seal the tunnel behind us? I could bring the whole lot down easy as pie. You'd better take the lead, though. There are better ways to go than being buried alive and... Shall we say recyclings? Need I say more? There was no need to say another syllable. Artemis jumped into the hole, grabbed Holly's shoulders, and began dragging her down the tunnel, past the blobs of luminous spittle, toward the proverbial light at the end. It was like traveling through space toward the Milky Way. The sounds of his own body were amplified. Gulping breath, drumming heartbeat, the bend and creak of muscle and sinew. Holly rolled along easily, her suit hissing on the rough surface like a nest of vipers. Or maybe there were snakes down here, the way Artemis' luck was going. I'm trying to do something good for a change, he reminded himself. And this is how the fates reward me. A life of crime was infinitely easier. Surface noise was amplified by the tunnel's acoustics. The gorilla sounded furious now. Artemis could hear the slap of fists on chest and an enraged huffing. He realizes he's been tricked. His theorizing was cut short by Mulch's appearance in the tunnel. The spittle bandage on his forehead, casting a zombie glow on his face. Gorilla incoming, he said as he gulped down lungfuls of air. Gotta go! Artemis heard twin thumps as the gorilla landed on the tunnel floor. The huge simian roared a challenge down the hole, and the noise grew in ferocity with each foot it traveled. Holly moaned, and Artemis pulled harder on her shoulders. Mulch sucked down air as fast as he could, bundling Artemis and Holly deeper into the tunnel. Twenty yards to go. They'd never make it. The gorilla was advancing, pulverizing each spittle lantern as he passed it, roaring with bloodlust. Artemis swore he saw a flash of teeth. The tunnel seemed to shudder with each blow. Large sections collapsed. Mud and rock clattered down on Artemis' head and shoulders. Dirt pooled in Holly's eye sockets. Mulch's cheeks ballooned, and he opened his lips the merest fraction to speak. Okay, he said in a helium voice. The tank is full. The dwarf gathered Artemis and Holly in his burly Popeye arms and vented every bubble of air in his body. The resulting jet stream propelled the group down the length of the tunnel. The trip was short, jarring, and confusing. The breath was driven from Artemis' lungs, and his fingers were stretched to cracking. But he would not let go of Holly. He could not let her die. The unfortunate gorilla was blown head over rump by the windstorm and yanked back up the tunnel as though tethered by it to an elastic cable. It whooped as it went, digging its fingers into the tunnel wall. Artemis, Holly, and Mulch popped from the tunnel mouth, bouncing and skittering along the ditch in a tangle of limbs and torsos. The stars above them were speed-streaked, and the moon was a smear of yellow light. An old famine wall halted their progress, crumbling under the impact of three bodies. <clears throat> More than 150 years this wall stood, coughed Artemis. And then we come along. He lay on his back, feeling thoroughly defeated. His mother would die, and Holly would soon hate him when he, she worked out the truth. All is lost. I have no idea what to do. Then, one of the notorious Wrathdown pylons sharpened in his vision. More specifically, the figures clambering along its service ladder. The lemur had escaped, Artemis realized, and is climbing as high as it can. A reprieve. There was still a chance. What I need to save the situation is a full LEP surveillance and assault kit. Perhaps I'll have number one send one back for me. Artemis distangled himself from the others and decided that underneath the pillar's cornerstone would be a secure spot. He tugged off the remaining stone stacked on top and wiggled his fingers under the final boulder and heaved. It came away easily, revealing nothing but worms and damp earth. No package from the future. For whatever reason, that particular trick would only work once. So, no help. I must make do with what is available. 
Artemis returned to where Holly and Mulch lay. Both were moaning. I think I split a gut rid of getting rid of that wind, said Mulch. There's a bit too much fear in the mix. Artemis's nose wrinkled. Will you be okay? Give me a minute and I'll be plenty strong enough to carry that huge amount of gold you promised me. Holly was groggy. Her eyes fluttered as she tried to pull herself together, and her arms flopped like fish out of the water. Artemis did a quick pulse and temperature check. Slight fever, but steady heartbeat. Holly was recovering, but it would be several minutes before she could control her mind or body. I must do this on my own, Artemis realized. No Holly, no butler. Just Artemis versus Artemis. And perhaps an Omni tool, he thought, reaching into Holly's pocket. The Rathdown electricity pylons had been featured in Irish news headlines several times since their erection. Environmentalists protested vehemently at the appearance of the gigantic pylons blighted an otherwise beautiful valley, not to mention the possible detrimental effect the uninsulated power lines could have on the health of anyone or anything living below their arcs. The National Electricity Board had countered these arguments by plating that the lines were too high to harm anything, and that to construct smaller pylons around the valley would blight ten times more land. And so, a half dozen of these metal giants bridged Rathdown Valley, reaching a height of 300 feet at their zenith. The pylon bases were often ringed by protesters, so much so that the power company had taken to servicing the lines by helicopter. On this night, as Artemis raced across the moonlit meadow, kicking up diamond dewdrops, there were no protesters ringing the pylons, but they had planted their signs like moon flags. Artemis slalomed through this optical course while simultaneously craning his neck to track the figures above. The lemur was on the wire now, silhouetted by the moon, scampering easily along the metal cable, while Artemis the Younger and Butler were stranded on the small platform at the pylon's base, unable to venture any farther. Finally, thought Artemis, a stroke or two of luck. Stroke one was that the lemur was suddenly up for grabs. Stroke the second was that while his younger nemesis had chosen to follow the silky Sifica directly up the pylon the animal was scaling, he himself could go up the adjacent pole which just happened to be the service pylon. Artemis reached the pylon's base, which was secured by a cage. The heavy padlock submitted instantly to a quick jab from the Omni tool, as did the steel equipment locker. Inside were various tools, walkie-talkies, and a Faraday suit. Artemis tugged on the heavy overalls, wiggling his fingers into the attached gloves, tucking his long hair inside the hood. The flame retardant and steel-threaded suit had to completely enclose him to act as a protective Faraday cage. Otherwise, he could not venture out onto the wires without being burned to a criminal mastermind cinder. More luck! An elevator platform ran along the side of the pylon. It was locked and key-coded, but locks quailed when faced with an Omni tool, and a key code was of little value when it was a simple matter to unscrew the control panel and activate the pulley manually. Artemis held tight to the safety rail as the tiny elevator shuddered and whined its way into the night sky. The valley spread out below him as he rose, and a westerly wind crept over the hills, tugging a strand of hair from his hood. Artemis gazed north, and for a fanciful moment imagined he could see the lights of Foul Manor. Mother is there, he thought, unwell now and unwell in the future. Perhaps I can just talk to my younger self, explain the situation. This thought was even more fanciful than the last. Artemis had no illusions about what he had been like at the age of ten. He had trusted no one completely but himself, not his parents, not even Butler. At the first mention of time travel, his younger self would have his bodyguard shoot a dart first and ask questions later. A lot of questions, and at great length. There was no time for explanations and debate. This battle would have to be won by wits and guile. The elevator grated into its brackets at the top of the pylon. A skull and crossbone sign was riveted to the tall safety gate. Even if Artemis had not been a genius, the sign would have been difficult to misinterpret. And just in case a total idiot did manage to scale the pylon, there was a second sign depicting a cartoon man being zapped by electricity from a cartoon pylon. The man's skeleton was clearly visible, x-ray style. Apparently electricity is dangerous, Artemis might have commented had Butler Bennett by his side. There was yet another lock on the safety gate, which delayed Artemis for about as long as the first two. Outside the safety gate was a small platform covered with wire mesh, with twin power lines humming directly beneath. There were half a million volts running through those lines, thought Artemis. I do hope there are no rips in this suit. Artemis squatted low, peering along the line. The lemur had paused halfway between the two pylons and was chattering to himself as if weighing up his options. 
Luckily for the small creature, it was only touching one line and so no current flowed through its body. If it put so much as a toe on the second line, the shock would spin it a hundred feet into the air, and it would be stone dead before it stopped revolving. On the far pylon, Artemis the Younger scowled at the animal while simultaneously trying to tempt it back with its bag of paste. There is nothing to do but go out on the wires and bring the lemur back yourself. The hot suit was equipped for moving across the wires. There was a safety cord wrapped around his waist and a lightning rod with a long pocket on its thigh. Below the platform was a small sled on insulated runners that the engineers used to hand crank themselves between pylons. Brains count for little now, he realized. What I need is balance. Artemis groaned. Balance was not his forte. Taking a deep breath, he crouched low and drew the lightning rod from his pocket. Almost as soon as it cleared the material, jets of white heart sparks jumped from the power lines connecting it with the tip of the rod. The stream buzzed and hissed like a neon snake. You were equalizing voltage, that's all. The electricity cannot hurt you. Perhaps not, but Artemis could already feel the hair standing on his neck. Was that anxiety, or a couple of volts sneaking in somewhere? Don't be absurd. If there is a hole, all volts will worm inside, not just a couple. Artemis was vaguely familiar with the technique for wire walking, as the National Broadcasting Service had done a new special on the high-wire daredevils who risked their lives to keep the lights of Dublin burning. It wasn't so much wire walking as wire crawling. The cables were extremely taut, and the maintenance engineers clipped on their safety lines, lay on the sled, then turned the winch until they reached the maintenance site. Simple, in theory, for a professional on a calm morning. Not so easy for an amateur in the dead of night with only the stars and the ambient light of nearby Dublin to guide him. Artemis sheathed his lightning rod and gingerly clipped his safety line to one of the cables. He held his breath, as though that could possibly make a difference, and laid his gloved hands on the metal sled. Still alive, a good start. Artemis inched forward, the metal warm under his clumsy gloved hands, until he was lying flat on the sled with a double-handed winch in front of his face. It was a delicate maneuver and would have been impossible had the cables not been tethered together at regular intervals. He began to twist and almost immediately the strain on his arm was tremendous as he moved his own body weight. The gym. Butler, you were right. I'll do weights. Anything. Just get me off these cables with that lemur under my arm. Artemis slid forward, feeling the runner scrape the rough metal of the cables, their intense hum sitting his teeth on edge and sending constant shivers coursing along his arched spine. The wind was low, but still threatened to topple him from his lofty perch, and the ground seemed like another planet, distant and uninviting. Twenty feet later, his arms ached, and he was noticed by the opposition. A voice floated across from the other pylon. I advise you to stay where you are, young man. If that suit has the tiniest rip, then one slip and those cables will liquefy your skin and melt your bones. Artemis scowled. Young man? Had he really been so obnoxious, so patronizing? It would take less than a second for you to die, continued ten-year-old Artemis. But that's quite long enough to be in mortal agony, don't you think? And all for nothing, as the lemur was obviously returned for this treat. Yes, he had been smug as well as obnoxious and patronizing. Artemis chose not to reply, concentrating his energy on staying alive and enticing the silky Sifika toward him. From his considerable reservoir of knowledge on just about everything, Artemis plucked the fact that smaller simians were comforted by a purring noise. Thank you, Jane Goodall. So he began to purr, much to the amusement of his younger self. Ha! <laughs> Listen, Butler, there's a cat on the wire. A big tom, I would say. Perhaps you should throw him a fish. But the mocking tone was undercut with tension. Young Artemis knew exactly what was going on. More purring, and it seemed to be working. The ghostly Sifika took a few cautious steps towards the elder Artemis, its beady black eyes glittering with starlight and perhaps curiosity. Holly would be proud. I'm talking to an animal! Even as he purred, Artemis winced at how ludicrous the situation had become. It was a typical foul-esque melodrama. Two parties hunting for a lemur on the highest power lines in Ireland. Artemis looked along the dip of the lines across to the other pylon, where Butler stood, jacket tail flapping around his thighs. The bodyguard leaned into the wind, and the intensity of his stare seemed to pierce the darkness, homing in on Artemis the Elder like a laser. I miss my bodyguard, thought Artemis. The lemur scampered closer, encouraged by the purring and perhaps fooled by the steel-gray hot suit. 
That's right, I am another lemur. Artemis's arms were shaking from the strain of turning the handles at such an awkward angle. Every muscle in his body was stretched to its limit, including several he had never used before. His head was dizzy from keeping his balance. All this and animal impersonations too! One yard now. That was the distance between Artemis and the lemur. There were no more taunts from the other side now. Artemis glanced across and found that his nemesis had his eyes closed and was breathing deeply, trying to come up with a plan. The lemur jumped onto the sled and touched Artemis's gloved hand tentatively. Contact. Artemis stayed stock still, apart from his lips, which burbled out a comforting purr. That's it, you little fellow. Climb onto my arm. Artemis looked into the lemur's eyes, and perhaps for the first time realized that it had emotions. There was fear in those eyes, but also a mischievous confidence. How could I have sold you to those madmen? He wondered. The lemur suddenly committed itself and scampered onto Artemis' shoulder. He seemed content to sit there while Artemis ferried it back to the service pylon. As Artemis retreated, he kept his eyes fixed on his younger self. He would never simply accept defeat like this. Neither of them would. Young Artemis' eyes suddenly snapped open and met his nemesis' stare. Shoot the animal, he said coldly. Butler was surprised. Shoot the monkey? It's a... Never mind, just shoot it. The man is protected by his suit, but the lemur is an easy target. But the fall. If it dies, it dies. I will not be thwarted here, Butler. If I cannot have that lemur, then no one will have it. Butler frowned. Killing animals was not in his job description, but he knew from experience that there was no point in arguing with the young master. At any rate, it was a bit late to protest now, perched atop a pylon. He should have spoken up more forcefully earlier. Whenever you're ready, butler, the target is not getting any closer. Out on the cables, Artemis the Elder could scarcely believe what he was hearing. Butler had drawn his pistol and was climbing over the rails to get a better shot. Artemis had not intended to speak, as interaction with the younger self could have serious repercussions from the future. But the words were out before he could stop them. Stay back! You don't know what you're dealing with! Oh, the irony. Ah, he speaks! called Artemis the younger across the abyss. How fortunate that we can understand each other! Well, understand this, stranger. I will have that silky Sifica, or it will die. Make no mistake. You must not do this. There's too much at stake. I must do this. I have no choice. Now send the animal over, or Butler will shoot. Through all of this, the lemur sat perched on the 14-year-old Artemis' head, scratching the stitching of his hood. So the two boys, who were only one boy, locked eyes for a long, tense moment. I would have done it, thought Artemis the Elder, shocked by the cruel determination in his own blue eyes. So he gingerly reached up one hand and plucked the silky Sifica from his head. You have to now go back, he said softly. Go back for the nice treat. And if I were you, I'd stick close to the big human. The little one isn't very nice. The lemur reached out and tweaked Artemis' nose, much as Beckett might have done, then turned and trotted along the cable toward Butler, nose sniffing the air, nostrils flaring as they located a sweet scent of Artemis' goodie bag. In a matter of seconds, it sat curled in the crook of young Artemis' elbow, contentedly dipping its long fingers into the sap. The young boy's face glowed with victory. Now, he said, I think it best that you stay exactly where you are until we leave. I think 15 minutes should be fine. After that, I advise you to be on your way and catch yourself fortunate that I did not have here butler and sedate you. Remember the pain that you are feeling now, the ache of utter defeat and hopelessness. And if you ever consider crossing swords with me again, reveal your memory of this pain and perhaps you will think twice. Artemis the Elder was forced to watch as Butler stuffed the lemur into a duffel bag, and Boy and Bodyguard commenced their climb down the service ladder. Several minutes later, the Bentley's headlights sighted the darkness as the car pulled away from Rathdown Park and onto the motorway, straight to the airport, no doubt. Artemis reached up and gripped the winch handles. He was not beaten yet. Far from it. He intended to cross swords with his ten-year-old self again just as soon as he possibly could. If anything, the boy's mocking speech had fueled his determination. Remember the pain? thought Artemis. I hate myself. 
I really do.